In aviation history, there are countless stories and reports of aircraft mysteriously disappearing. These stories have been around for as long as there have been planes flying, but there are some that seem to stand out as uniquely strange or mysterious. One of them that stood out to me personally when I first read about it, it was the disappearance of a B-47 bomber on March the 10th, 1956 over the Mediterranean Sea. The plane's call sign was Ink Spot 59 and it would disappear without a single nut or bolt ever being found again, including the two nuclear cores that it was carrying when it vanished. B-47 bombers crashing in the mid-1950s isn't exactly something to raise an eyebrow about. That may sound grim, but the fact of the matter is, 203 B-47s crashed during a service life, most of those happening in a five-year span during the mid to late 1950s. But this particular disappearance is a little more unusual, at first glance anyways. On the morning of March 10, 1956, Four B-47 Stratojets took off from McDill Air Force Base in Florida, destined for Ben Gurrier Air Force Base in Morocco. It was part of a standard deployment of B-47s which were mainly based overseas at forward operating bases due to their short range. The bomber that would ultimately go missing that day had a crew of three and was carrying a payload of two M104 nuclear capsules, nicknamed bird cages. These capsules were specifically designed containers similar to a small bank vault and were standard transportation containers for plutonium pits of nuclear weapons. The doomed B-47's call sign was Ink Spot 59. There were two scheduled mid-air refuelings during the 4,600 mile flight, the first of which would take place near the Azores. There, the bomber group would link up with four KC-97 Stratotankers based at Elagis Air Base. For this to happen, the bomber group would need to first descend from their cruising altitude of approximately 35,000 feet down to around 14,000 feet. Each bomber would match speeds with the tanker aircraft and attach the refueling hose to the refueling point on the bomber. And then, after refueling was complete, together the group of B-47s would climb back up to 35,000 feet and continue onwards towards Morocco. The first refueling went as planned. Ink Spot 59 received 52,000 pounds of fuel and the other three B-47s received 50,000 pounds of fuel. The group climbed back up to 35,000 feet and within a few hours, the group of B-47s were flying above the Strait of Gibraltar. At this point, their second refueling was planned and they made radio contact with the group of KC-97 Stratotankers that were scheduled to meet them off the coast of Morocco. The group of B-47s began their descent down to 14,000 feet, but this time the weather conditions were not as good as before. Even though the B-47s had established visual contact with the group of KC-97 tankers, there were heavy, layered cloud levels that they had to descend through. Despite this, all four bombers had remained in radio contact as they descended. As the group reached 14,000 feet, they discovered that Ink Spot 59 wasn't with them. They had been in almost constant radio contact with each other this entire time. But suddenly none of the other three bombers or the four KC-97s could reach the fourth bomber. The crew of the KC-97 that was supposed to refuel Inkspot 59 later reported that they had visual, radar, and radio contact with Inkspot 59 until the bomber was within 7 miles of the tanker group. That's when all contact was lost with the bomber. The three B-47s that remained stayed the course linked up with their respective tankers, refueled, and climbed back up to 35,000 feet and flew the approximate 250 miles south and landed safely at Bangor Air Force Base in Morocco. Once on the ground, the radar logs of the remaining bombers and the KC-97 tankers were looked at. None of the radar logs showed the missing B-47 traveling any farther than 5 degrees west longitude. None of the pilots or the crew of any of the aircraft said they heard an explosion or received any distress calls from Ink Spot 59. The plane had simply vanished. Initially, there were some reports of an explosion being heard on the ground near the southeast coast of Morocco between Tetuan and Ceuta. The area was extensively searched shortly thereafter, but no wreckage was ever found. To this day, the plane, its crew, and its nuclear cargo remain missing. The last radar position for Ink Spot 59 was slightly west of the entrance to the Strait of Gibraltar over the Atlantic Ocean. The last radio contact made with the plane was approximately in the same location. Obviously, given the nature of the disappearance and the fact that not even a single piece of the airplane was ever found, there are some pretty crazy theories on message boards and online that people have came up with to explain its disappearance. One thing I read was that the bomber had flew into a wormhole as it flew through the cloud bank, or that the crew had actually defected to the Soviet Union, flew the plane to a Soviet airbase, and sold the nuclear cores and the bomber to the Soviets. The wormhole theory is obviously a bit far-fetched, and even the theory about the crew defecting doesn't add up. 
For one, the crew wouldn't have had the knowledge that they would have nuclear materials on board the bomber until shortly before takeoff, which was the reason they didn't tell pilots this type of information beforehand. And also, the plane only had approximately four hours of fuel, give or take, when it disappeared. If their plan was to defect, they would have at least refueled first. That way they could have climbed back to 35,000 feet and ran at maximum cruising speed until they reached Soviet airspace without having to worry about conserving fuel. As I dug into this incident, I found that newspaper reports from the local area around McGill Air Force Base in Florida stated that the plane had disappeared over land in eastern Morocco. And if you research more, you'll see official reports that state a large-scale search was actually conducted by the U.S., French, and British in northeastern Morocco, south of the city of Tetuan. This wasn't a volunteer group of villagers either. It was a wide-scale military operation between three major powers as a joint force, air, land, and sea. They scoured every corner of the region for this bomber. Losing two plutonium pits is not exactly something Dwight D. Eisenhower wanted to deal with at the time during an election year. Who will you vote for? What's your decision? What do you say? Me? I like Ike. There was also a very significant issue that I never saw mentioned in any information that I read about Inkspot 59 disappearing, but I just wanted to include it because I think that it's an interesting perspective to look at this missing bomber from. In Northwest Africa, a potential Vietnam level conflict was brewing. The Algerian Revolution was taking place just 100 miles east of the search area. It should also drive home how important finding this bomber was, especially if France, the country in control of Algeria at the time, was willing to divert precious military assets from its ongoing war in Algeria to go walk around the desert searching for missing American aircraft. The Algerian Revolution wasn't some weekend protest. It was a two-year-old guerrilla war by March of 1956 that was to eventually become, for lack of a better phrase, the Vietnam of North Africa. It was a major hotspot that the United States and Eisenhower were closely watching in 1956. The Soviet Union had been actively wooing and fomenting revolution all across the Middle East via the National Liberation Front. You really can't grasp how serious this situation was until you look at old, small-town newspapers from this era. The conflict in Algeria and how Eisenhower and France and on resolving this problem was front page news that was plastered all across headlines at this time. In March of 1956, it wasn't far-fetched to think that Algeria could be where World War III began. When you consider these circumstances, this B-47 going missing in that region with two nuclear cores on board could have been a monumental international diplomatic nightmare with serious implications attached to it. Not only were tensions high because of the growing Soviet influence in the region, but the relationship between the U.S. and France was strained due to their mutual interest in the region. France wanted to preserve its colonial empire by any means necessary, while Eisenhower and the Soviets saw Algerian independence as inevitable by this point in the conflict, and both wanted to woo the fledgling power structure emerging in Algeria over to their side in order to gain a foothold in the new country and preserve his loyalty. The idea of hearts and minds inside of the Pentagon was a new one, but the concept would become synonymous a decade later during the Vietnam War as the United States aimed to prevent the spread of Soviet influence around the world. As France's brutal tactics ratcheted up in Algeria, support for France from Washington DC was eroded, which caused a good deal of tension between the two allied powers. This broken arrow incident had occurred at the worst possible time in the worst possible place. So given the fact that official reports placed the plane as lost over the Mediterranean Sea, but other reports that were based off of information gathered from military personnel at McDill Air Force Base stating that the plane was believed to be lost over dry land near a potential conflict zone that could possibly trigger World War III, it's a no-brainer that this particular broken arrow is especially murky and information about it is very hard to come by. The last thing the Pentagon wanted at this time was to have nuclear weapons components strewn across the Algerian desert with three world powers scouring the sand trying to Get to them first. If American, French, and Russian troops ran into each other on the ground while searching for this wreckage, the results could have been catastrophic given the high levels of tension at the time. It is much easier to say that the plane exploded over the open Mediterranean in international waters and that no trace was ever found of it. Diplomatically, given the stakes, it makes absolute sense to make this the official story. But even if that is the truth, and it's just a hypothesis based on some of the information I've been able to gather, it still leaves the question, what actually caused the accident to begin with? To be frank, B-47s were known to spontaneously disintegrate. It wouldn't be the first or last time a B-47 was on a routine flight and suddenly and catastrophically tore itself to pieces. 
When they were designed in the late 1940s, aircraft engineers were still building jets to handle the levels of stress that piston engines were able to cause. The V-47, however, was a fast, high-flying bomber. The levels of metal fatigue that jet engines were able to induce on airframes is much higher than piston engines. This concept was not completely understood at the time, so routine airframe inspection schedules for B-47s were not performed as often as they should have been. Higher stress levels, combined with longer inspection intervals, is a recipe for a lot of airplane crashes. Another dangerous factor in the B-47's flight characteristics was something called Coffin Corner. At the B-47's ideal cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, its stall speed was only about 10 miles per hour below its maximum cruising speed. Simply pulling up too sharply, or any type of unintentional movement of the controls, could cause the bomber to lose enough airspeed that the plane would enter into a stall. The autopilot for the B-47 was extremely rudimentary, so in order for the B-47 to cross the Atlantic, the pilot had to fly the plane manually the entire way, constantly checking airspeed and adjusting throttle in order to maintain maximum fuel efficiency, but also avoiding a dangerous stall. Obviously, this would be extremely tiresome for any pilot. The bomber was also quite unstable. It could not be relied upon to maintain a heading if the pilot's attention was diverted, especially if the plane was flying at night or in poor visibility. One common thing you will read as you research the B-47 is pilots noting that if you were flying by instruments alone, you had better pay attention to them because the B-47 was not very forgiving. Oftentimes the plane would be in a bank or pitched up or down slightly when you look back at the gauges. In most aircraft, this was not a huge concern, but with the B-47's coffin corner issues, it could be deadly. When the B-47 Ink Spot 59 vanished, the plane was performing a controlled descent through cloud layers with poor visibility. But as with most things in life, the simplest explanation is almost always correct. Most likely the pilot was having to rely on his instruments the whole time during the descent due to poor visibility. While he was doing this, he was also trying to locate a tanker group somewhere thousands of feet below him and coordinate their rendezvous, while also remaining aware that in the clouds around him there were three other bombers and not colliding with them. It's easy to understand that he simply may not have been paying attention to his instruments because his attention was diverted. The plane simply pitched her bank gently while he was not paying attention, and when he finally realized the problem and attempted to recover the aircraft, the airframe became overstressed and disintegrated inside of the dense cloud cover. At roughly 520 miles per hour, the plane would have been traveling around 8.5 miles per minute. If the plane had veered off course for just a few minutes while moving through these dense cloud layers, by the time the plane tore apart and the wreckage had time to fall almost 6 miles down to the ground, it could have easily been 20 to 25 miles from the last place it was known to have been, which could have put it out of the scope of the search and rescue zone. It is also plausible that the wreckage was actually located, the nuclear core is recovered, and the entire operation to do all of this was simply kept top secret, out of the necessity given the diplomatic tensions at the time between the US, France, and the Soviet Union. Simply saying that the plane exploded over deep water and no wreckage was located was an easy way to brush the situation under the rug and prevent the possibility of further escalation of conflict in the region due to a broken arrow event taking place there. This incident isn't very isolated and was only one of many mysterious military aircraft that were lost and never located during the Cold War. I'm going to try to start making videos for, the, for like a series specifically dedicated to military aircraft that crashed under mysterious circumstances or vanished without a trace. Stay tuned and like this video if you got any entertainment value out of it. Comment your thoughts on what may have happened to the plane and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Also, I know I've been kind of like MIA for a while. My family has been going through a lot. We've, my mother-in-law just passed away recently. I changed jobs. So it's just been kind of chaotic the last three or four months. Um, I know this isn't the video that I was supposed to put up that I gave like a teaser to on my wall back in October, but that one's still coming. I'm still, I still got that one on the back burner. So don't think I just decided not to make that because <laughs> I, I still have plans to make that video. It's just kind of long and really complicated. I have my new schedule and everything I have is going to be like way better for making videos. So keep an eye out because there will be new videos being posted, especially this month and next month. I'm going to really make a push to get up a lot of content. Thanks for all your support guys i really appreciate it and i guess i'm back